Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's live show. We are going to be talking about breastfeeding with confidence after a C-section with the Thompson method, Thompson method. Now, this is absolutely possible for you. So please do stay tuned if you want to hear all of our suggestions and hear from the very, very special Dr. Robin Thompson, who is here with me now. Hello, lovely lady. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> After a very busy day, straight into another seat for another video call, huh? <laughs> Are you overwhelming with all those lovely words? I get a bit, you know, a bit embarrassed. Oh, you. You're too <laughs> humble. Lovely, lovely lady indeed. So like I said, we are here to share with you as much as we can in our very short time um, and, and hopefully help you feel a little bit more confident. And, um, and we will signpost you as well in the right direction towards some really, really inf informative and amazing resources. So I want to start, first of all, with one of my favourite quotes um, by Dr. Robin, which is about the transition. Dr. Robin, would you like to start with that? You would like me to talk about the transition? So there's no segmentation to a woman's pregnancy, her labour, her birth, or her breastfeeding. They are all her unique transitions, the way she transitions through each of those. And uh, we, we shouldn't be, you know, using the language that segments everything because you're not segmented. Mm -hmm. Yes, and that beautifully fits in with today's session, really, because we are going to be encouraging you to really take time during pregnancy um, to focus on not only your birth and the aspects of planning around what will be your C-section, but actually in those hours, days and weeks following the birth as well, when you'll be healing and you will be going through that transition, which continues on from pregnancy into motherhood, or maybe you're becoming a second or third. Um, time parent it's still a very big big transition following mm. on pregnancy so dr robin let's talk about education during pregnancy why is it important to not leave things to the last minute or to see how things go in particularly if you are going in for a plan c section well over the years my experience of being with beautiful women i have learned that the more knowledge that they have the more benefit it is to them and they are more likely to ask the questions that that they need to ask and if they're not able to do that pre pre-planning and that pre-information sharing and learning then often they feel feel quite con uh, contained by what's put to them all the time. So asking questions is so, so, so important. And feeling confident to do that is also very important. So oh. the aim is to, to gather knowledge, to increase confidence, and to give you the nourishment that you need to be able to do the things that you need to do. I love that. The nourishment, the brain nourishment, that's something I hugely lacked. Um, going into birth and breastfeeding with my first and I feel that confidence that you're speaking of education knowledge it's power it, it makes you feel powerful to make informed decisions because that's what this is about ultimately um, being able to understand the decisions you're making um, that may not have been explained to you very well it can often leave you feeling really confused um, in a situation of panic when you're trying to make a quick decision based on very minimal facts usually and information that you might not even understand if it's in medical jargon um, so mm -hmm. Dr Robin does go into so much detail on all of these terms and terminologies and how to understand and make those decisions appropriately to fit your unique situation because no two women are the same and Dr Robin helped me understand that not only in my personal life but also talking to you lovely ladies as well so the, the some of the common um, challenges we wanted to touch upon today with c-section birthing and then following on into into your lovely breastfeeding journey um, just the two main ones we want to talk about, of course, there are um, always so, so sometimes there are more, sometimes there are less. It's, it's very unique. But two of the common ones that we see, and I'm sure Dr. Robin will talk more in depth of this, is mother and baby separation can sometimes happen um, following a C-section. And in particular, um, according to the research, if this is done um, before um, the guesstimate gestation of 40 weeks and also um, the sleepy baby syndrome. So Dr. Robin, would you like to touch upon those two points? Yeah, and add to that estimated gestation too. Mm. So it's important that a mother and baby, a mother has carried her baby right through the, her transition to this situation. 
And it's very important that that little baby and her are connected as soon as possible, the moment that baby is born, especially if the baby's APGAR score is seven or above. That's so, so, so important. They should not be separated. Kept warm by a little cover go over them, not putting hats on their heads, but just keeping the mother and the baby together. Uh, very, very important for the mother's uh, recovery, for the baby's recovery, for milk production, all of those things help with the hormone balance in her body uh, during these difficult times. So have I answered that appropriately? Perfectly, yeah, for sure. sure. And and we, we, I mean, in your prenatal sessions, which are included in the online program, you go into great detail about mother and baby separation, how you can prepare yeah. for that. Actually, this is important to prepare for, even if you aren't going in for a planned C-section, because anything can happen, you, you can make, a plan on what you would wish to happen yeah. and then it's important to have that knowledge education behind you and support um yeah. to know what to do in a situation where that may happen which is unlikely but still good to yeah. um, to be prepared for and mother and separation yeah. is quite common um sometimes in c-sections if the mother doesn't know about the app score would you agree yeah. And it's really important at that very special time to come together and not be separated. Other people can wait as long as there's no emergency and that the mother is well and the baby is, as I said, at Gar School, seven or above, uh, because that connection then is a lifelong connection. It has amazing uh, outcomes for a whole range of things over a lifetime. It's not just the, the first breastfeed, but the first breastfeed is the starting point. And if a mother's wanting to breastfeed her baby, that's the unique time to come together. So wow. separation in my research did show that there were major breastfeeding problems. And that's not to say that those um, those those bumps in the road can't be overcome, especially yeah. if you are prepared during pregnancy or know things to to put in place so that um, it doesn't make things more challenging. Um, yeah. So the introduction of the bottle and how to sort of go around mother and baby separation are things that come yeah. with that, the challenges that come with that. And we yeah. are commonly seeing um, unnecessary separation of mother and baby, actually. So not even with C-section births, but with um, what yeah. seem to routine be quite behavior, straightforward. Routine procedures. Yeah, yeah in routine, routine procedures. procedure. Exactly. And so when, like I said, hats and taking baby to be weighed straight away before mum's had a cuddle, it's, it's, it's quite scary. And when your baby's taken from you, it makes you wonder then what are they doing to your baby? So they being my colleagues, you know, and they have a routine process that goes on in the system, which I talk about as systemization. And that systemization they're not realizing has dramatic effects on you and your baby. So question for me is, why do they need to do all those things as routine procedures at that moment when a baby belongs with its mother? Mm. and thankfully we are now in a time where there are many questions like this being asked and this week is a special week um, for midwives and for women because it is maternal mental health awareness week and on Friday the 5th of May it is the international day of the midwife and mm. thankfully both those the both the themes that are being celebrated this year are in correlation with research and evidence so hopefully Lots of new evidence has been emerging in these last couple of years. Hopefully we are seeing that that will be implemented in the next um, in the next decade, um, rather than making more um, policies to separate mum and baby, which has happened in the previous decade, which is quite scary. So be prepared. I think you'd agree, Robin, be prepared for mother and baby uh, separation, but also be prepared that that may not need to happen. Um, of course, and I think a mother's wise enough to know that if her baby needs to be separated for a very valid reason, then of course there's no question about that. Yeah, it's just course. where possible, it, or not where possible, it's where the baby's APCAR score is above seven, seven or above, not above, seven or above, and the mother is well. You know, she yeah. doesn't have and, any major complications either. And of course, yeah, we have to think of mum too. But we have recently mm. heard a beautiful um, C-section story. We hear, we hear hundreds of them, but this one's a very new one. Um, I'll pop the link below in the comments section for all of our wonderful stories that women have very kindly shared with us. Um, 
the, these are women that have implemented the Thompson method and how it's helped them in their journey following a C-section. I'll put those below. Um, but recently, this lady shared that she went in for an emergency C-section, so it wasn't part of her plan. But thanks to Dr. Robin's resources, she was able to make informed decisions quickly. Um, and in her plan, she had in, in, incorporated a space at the end for or what she would really want and her, what her wishes were in the case of emergency. So baby was passed to her chest immediately. Um, there was a delayed period before the cord was cut and there was gentle music in the background. And uh, she asked for minimal touching on mother and baby as well um, until she was then wheeled off to um, the labor ward after she was stitched up. So it seems to be there is um, what you would like to call a mother consideration happening during these C-sections, Robin, which is what we want to see more of, right? Yeah, I would say, hang on a minute, I would say she'd be taken to the recovery room to recover before she wouldn't have been taken to the labour ward, that are, unless it's different in, in the UK than it is to... I'm yeah. sure you know more than me, and I'm sure it is the recovery room. It <laughs> makes more sense. Recovery. They'd um, have to keep an eye on her and make sure everything yeah, is going Yeah, I, I know on. that here in the UK we are short of beds, so that may change wherever you are willed to. But yeah, yeah it would true. definitely be advised yeah. to go to a recovery yeah. room to keep an eye on uh, mum after yeah. a very serious surgery. Yeah. So now just remind me of the point. You're making. Well, that was the point. You beautifully touched on it there. And um, I guess we could move into the sleepy baby syndrome. So, Dr. Robin, you do talk about this quite often, um, not um, only in relation yeah. to C-section, but in, in, in relation to pain relief as well. Yeah. Um, um, tell us a little bit about what the sleepy baby syndrome is. Well, in my experience, I have seen this for many years now, and, and the literature doesn't always talk about it in a way that uh, we're actually observing it. So, Rachel... Austin, my head of education and my senior team, we see this all the time because we are with women breastfeeding soon after birth often. Today we've been with two mums with four day old babies. One was four, one was five, I think five day old babies. Uh, I think that we have to really be aware that when a mother has opioids, her baby will be sleepy. And, you know, as the opioids come through her bloodstream, through her milk, crosses over to her milk, then the baby has to have time for the binding process to work, for that to be excreted from her body, from the baby's body. And also it has the risk of increasing jaundice as well. So we keep a very close eye on those little babies when we're talking with those mothers who, you know, who have to have opioids for whatever reason that might be so that we work with her to produce her milk to give to her baby rather than to give non-human milk to her baby and we're very privileged to be able to do that to be able to talk with her and and bring out the best for her to be able to do what she needs to do with her baby and and so that's the joy of my life being with beautiful women and their babies oh, and I, yeah i have seen it for so long now and we have recorded so many stories of women so many stories of women and these include those with the sleepy baby syndrome yeah absolutely so how i refer to it it's like a syndrome the opioids are, are affecting the babies we might not think they are but they definitely are when you're observing what we are doing absolutely and and some of our some of our members are actually sharing their experiences on how, how they were able to navigate those um those few weeks postpartum and um, where they experienced the baby baby being sleepy yeah. often at the yeah. breast um in general yeah. But actually um, having the knowledge on what to do, like you said, to avoid non-human milk, which is very possible, um, it, it really helps women to, um, to get breastfeeding off to the best start, despite having some um, minor or major complications from the get-go. So do get in touch. If you are pregnant and even if you're not planning a C-section, be prepared um, and, 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 and arm yourself with knowledge so that wherever you do choose to give birth, you are fully prepared for any situation, um, no matter how unique. Um, you have that education behind you and you have a network of really informative women to reach out to for support if, if, it, if you need to. So um, mm. hospital policy is not law. Dr. Robin, you are very passionate about this topic. And thankfully, I, I've, I've had the privilege of talking to you about it many times. 
and it made it my passion during my birth and following now it's something that I research into constantly how many women de- determine their births around their hospital policy so I've been told no I can't well, get they don't have a choice in lots. yeah mm-hmm. they don't have a choice it's forced upon them in lots of occasions but once they know and understand the law of consent in their country wherever they might be because keeping in mind that we talk with women all over the world and every day we're busy with that and it's a, and again it's a real privilege to be able to do that the law of consent is so important to understand and many of my colleagues rachel reed um you know i can't name them all (laughs) but many many of my colleagues follow have follow and inform and give information on the law of consent and uh, I, i think if a mother understands that then she can make up her mind what it is she needs to do and yes the law of consent plays a huge role in decision making yeah for sure and and you mentioned Rachel Reed there I know you also um, introduced me to Sarah Sarah Wickham and um, Deborah Niger as well which are here in the UK and these are all wonderful women who are sharing statistics and research in an understanding way for us to interpret the research which is really helpful when you are trying and, to and um, you can add to that dr kirsten small from australia too she's Wonderful. done some amazing research on fetal monitoring and what that leads to so there's a lot a lot of amazing people around um and and uh dr kirsten small is an obstetrician too so you know it's ah. it's it's a great network of people all around the world. They're not just here, they're all around the world. People who have knowledge and are sharing that knowledge with, with lots of Making a stand worldwide, yeah. globally, yeah. Um, to make a yeah. difference. Yeah, and, sure. they're, and they're sharing it with midwives and with women as well. So that's good. Mm. Absolutely. So so those things are all something that you can can consider when writing your unique birth and breastfeeding plan. And Dr. Robin goes into great detail also about those three golden hours, which you may be worried about and um, not having if you're going in for a C-section. So do do get in touch with us because there is so much you can do to prepare for those three golden hours. And we have some wonderful stories on how women have enjoyed their three golden hours following a C-section. Thank you to this very modest but lovely and informative lady here that I'm joined with. Um, so, yes, get in touch. We have um, Dr. Robin has created a really helpful birth plan template. I used it um, this this last year with, with giving birth to my second baby. And I was able to take things out and put things in and make it my own. And it was such a really helpful resource to have just to get you started when you feel like you're overwhelmed and have no idea where to begin. Because you, of course, are not a professional um, and and let's remember, and Dr. Robin has already made this point because she beats me to it, that you are powerful, you are knowledgeable within yourself. Um, Dr. Robin, would you like to talk a little bit about your experience with how a wonderful mother knows innately what to do? Yes, a mother, a mother's instinct leads the way. You know, a mother, a mother is there to protect her baby all of the time. And if she's not well, of course, she needs help to do that. But, and she needs advocates and strong people around her. However, as long as she's treated with respect and somebody sits down and talks with her, not stands over and talks to her or sits at a desk behind a desk and talks to her, we need to talk with each other. So bringing chairs around close together is much more personal and much more rewarding for the mother to be able to talk the things that she needs to talk and also listen to the things that the other people have to say as well. And not to be fearful of things, to be really asking the questions and especially in relation to the law of consent asking the right questions is so important mm-hmm. and look it took takes me can i tell a little short story please do it takes me way back to a beautiful mother who had a motor car accident and she was unconscious and it and she was carrying her baby and two of my colleagues were in that hospital at that time working and they or one was working there and one came in but they all knew each other which was good and um once she was you know she was still unconscious but once she was well cared for in the in the emergency in the um you know where do they 
Intensive care? I don't know. Intensive much either, care. Robin. I think I've had a big, big day today. Yes, you my have. Brain's, yes, my you brain's have. unwinding, not winding up. <laughs> and so she was helped to breastfeed her baby while she was unconscious. And she continued breastfeeding that baby for goodness knows how long. I can't remember. It was oh, quite giving long. me goosebumps. Yeah. And then when she became, when she was roused and came to consciousness, she had her baby with her in her arms. And so that to me taught me something that was so, so, so important to understanding that we can work around these things if we think it positively and we don't. Of course, if the mother's you know, in a dire straits, we don't do anything like that. But this mother was now stabilised. She wasn't there consciously feeding her baby, but her colleagues and her friend actually helped her do that. And they brought her baby to her every single feed. So her milk production was there. I think that goes to show how important it is to research your own wishes as well. So many women don't consider what they would prefer. No, um, and having no. having your own preferences and sharing those with your loved yeah. ones is yeah. a big deal, I think. That's right. Absolutely. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, That's beautiful. Can you hear beautiful. any background? Can you hear any background noise here? That's okay. It seems like it's perfect timing as we're coming to the end of the show anyway. Okay, I'm <laughs> glad of that. <laughs> well, thank you so much again for sharing <laughs> your um, sharing your brain knowledge and your brain power, Dr. Robin. And of course, for those watching, um, if you're pregnant, congratulations from us. It's a special, special time. And we would like to be a part of your journey moving forward in this wonderful transition. So do get in touch, read our stories, um, get to know Dr. Robin herself, her methods, the Thompson Method, and um, reach out with any questions. And I will be back here next week with a, a really lovely story from one of our twin mothers. So thank you very much for watching and we will see you soon. Thanks, Dr. Robin. Thank you, Chelsea. You're a wonder. Thank you. <laughs> oh, bless you. <laughs>